wait. Do you have a TV? No. I just like to read the TV guide. Read the TV guide. I don't need a TV. Hello and welcome to TV Guidance Counselor. As always, I am Ken Reed, your TV Guidance Counselor, and I want to welcome you to one of my favorite shows we've recorded thus far in the year and a half or so that we've been doing the show. Uh, if you are tuning in for the first time, welcome. This is a very fun show. My guest this week is Miss Karen Duffy, who you may know better as Duff. Uh, when she was a VJ on MTV in the 90s, she's also an actress, as we discuss here. You may know her from Dumb and Dumber, or Blank Check, or any other of the movies she's been in, and a correspondent on TV Nation, which was an excellent show. She's a fantastic writer. Uh, after this episode, if you do not already have it, definitely go out and buy her book. Uh, it is fantastic. She's got several books, actually. But uh, Model Patient, My Life is an Incurable Wise-Ass is her first book about uh, her struggles with uh, her illness. And it is incredibly well-written, very funny. And she could not have been nicer. Uh, she is one of the best people I have ever met and interviewed on this show by far. Uh, she was incredibly gracious. I loved talking to Karen. Very, very funny, smart, fun person. And Wait till you hear some of the stories in this episode. They are uh, unbelievable, uh, but true. So, as always, sit back, relax, and enjoy, as I know you will, this week's episode with my guest, Karen Duffy. <laughs> the globe to bring you the constant variety of sport, the thrill of victory, and the agony of defeat. The human drama of athletic competition. Karen Duffy, hello. Hello. So nice to have you in my office. Thank you for having me in your office. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very, very hot day in New York. It's very summertime-like, although mm -hmm. it is not summer. Mm -hmm. uh, very, I know, I know. We just went right from... I was... It was freezing at our farm in Connecticut. We yeah. actually... It was 32 degrees, and Too now cold. it's 90. Well, it's like going away to the tropics uh, in the middle of the city. Well, it is, I know. But you're holding up very well, I'll say, Ken. Well, thank you. Thank you. It was, uh, I tried not to walk around too much, as I, <laughs> as I often sweat very, very profusely. Mm -hmm. um, so we were just chatting, and you were talking about how you kind of managed to get on MTV, which was, which was pretty fascinating, um, not to jump right in. Mm -hmm. But uh, you were saying you were working at, a, at a, um, an, a home for the elderly. At a nursing home, at a yeah. Nursing home. I've, yeah. Always, I've worked at a nursing home since I was 13. Okay. It, Actually, 12. So I started when I was in seventh grade. Grade. And you grew up in New Jersey? In New Jersey and New York. My okay. family runs uh, Duffy Sanitation, which okay. is the longest continually operated family business in New York City. Very nice. So, well, sanitation is a long, the second oldest business in the world. True, after true. After the first one. Um, so right across the street from my family's uh, townhouse is a nursing home. Um, okay. And I started volunteering there when I was in seventh grade. And then when I went away to college... I went and studied uh, gerontology, uh -huh. and then went got my post grad degree, and I wound up going back to work at the nursing home that I'd volunteered at since I was a kid. Right, right. And I loved it. And I I was saying that my experience working with Alzheimer's patients who have a two inch attention span. Right. I really had to speak clearly. I had to elocute. Um, and I also know how to speak with my hands right. to kind of. And what's interesting too is just. Um, my physiognomy, I am have black hair, white skin, and red lips. Yes. And to elderly people, they see gray-haired doctors and white lab coats against a white wall. Right. So they, they really can't see who's talking <laughs> right, to them. Right. So I would just really dress... stood out. I stood yeah. out so I could get people to pay attention to me. Right, right. So I knew all these tricks. And I was like, you know, look at those jackasses on MTV. This I mean, I'm a jackass too. Why shouldn't I do, I do that? Literally jackasses later. So I wound <laughs> up getting, um, I made a video. And she just unsolicited sent a video in. Sent it in. Uh, I sent it on a Friday and it was Memorial Day. And on Tuesday they said, come on in. That's, that's insane. Like, I know. It was, I really didn't have high expectations. I'd been working, um... At the nursing home, but okay. also m as a model and doing a, a ton of commercials. Right, I'd so you've been doing some stuff. I'd been in front of the camera, but never, right. uh, never hosting. Right, never as you looking directly into the camera and sort of speaking to yes. the viewer. Mm -hmm. right. I essentially had like the one pose that everyone does when they make 
like what they think is their hot face in the mirror. Okay, I mean, yeah, that's yeah, essentially yeah. what I did. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, and what was the first commercial you like? What were some of the commercials the f- you did? Sk- Skippy peanut butter. Oh, okay, classic. Um, oh, Annette Fotichello. Uh, she was it. Yes, uh, and uh, I remember on the set of that peanut butter commercial. Um, I grew up with a lot of people who um, are gaffers and best boys, right. and and I remember being on set and this woman, Dee Dee Dolan, who I went to high school with, like a big chip tooth and yeah. tattoos, and she's like, wait a minute, aren't you one of those Duffy girls that <laughs> I graduated <laughs> from Park Ridge High with? And I was like, oh, no, no, you're thinking of my older sister. Right, right, right. Like, and I totally lied to her face. Nice. But I did about, maybe, about 100 commercials. Oh, wow. So I did a ton of commercials. And they were shooting, so in, in, this was in the mid-80s, probably? But, uh, late, 80s. late 80s. Late 80s, early 90s. And, and really, they were shooting the majority of commercials in New York at the time. Like all the, all the TV production for most shows, aside from like soap operas and some game shows, basically moved to LA in the 60s, mm-hmm. late 60s, early 70s. But commercials, soap operas, and the news kind of stayed And in Saturday Night Live. And Saturday Night Live. And then MTV comes along and mm-hmm. in 81 and was the biggest thing ever probably in New York at the time. And you, you were in a really unique place in mtv because you were kind of the first generation of vjs that kind of grew up watching it well yeah it was interesting because uh i went to school in colorado in the west coast and mtv wasn't there right and i actually at a nursing home i couldn't afford right uh and it's not on in the nursing home yeah it wasn't on the nursing home (laughs) they were watching that um so uh it wasn't until i actually was on the channel that i actually well i mean i i I mean i was completely aware of it and i would watch it at friends houses right but i didn't actually get it wired legally into my house where you paid for it right and um so uh it was interesting that having the experience working with the elderly right uh transferred to working um with the audience that also had a two-inch attention span right and and musicians who often do as well true so there was a (laughs) uh there was a challenge and um i would go i and i really wanted to get up to speed because i wanted to be good right and uh so I would go to the Museum of Broadcasting and just watch all the old Frank Sinatra variety specials. Which probably sounds crazy to people now because essentially now you could just probably plug that into YouTube and see mm-hmm. the whole history of everything. We would just physically go to what was essentially a television video library yes. and sit in a booth mm-hmm. and watch these things with headphones on. And, and they still had the commercials yeah. and it was amazing. And I just watched, I was like, okay, like, I was a huge Sinatra fan. Right. And Is that because of the New Jersey, New York connection? That's definitely. And his amazing pipes. But I just really thought, like, he did it so well. Right. And one of the things that I noticed was he was always really dressed. Right. And was very um, self-deprecating and really let, when a performer was on, just let them shine. Right. And uh, so he always just seemed so gracious. So I kind of in, internalized that, and this was at really the height of grunge in right. the 90s, right. but I would always have stockings and high heels right. on. Be and dressed for television. Be dressed. Yeah. And, you know, my um, esteemed colleagues uh, was a uh, Karen... There was a woman, Karen. This, was there Carolyn Hedman? No, it was song? after Carolyn Hedman. There was, it was spooky. It was a guy, Steve Isaacs. Oh, yes, yep. Um, and Kennedy just started yes, towards Kennedy, the tail end we of all you. started. To, no, we all started together. at the same time? Yeah, right around the same time. Because after you was like John Sencio and like I Dallas and Bill Bellamy. That yes, was like yes, yes. 90s. I work with Bill, too. We kind of um, overlapped. But kind of like right after me, it was... Um, Dave Holmes, yeah. who's amazing, and Carson, yeah. and then they just blew up. And then up. they don't have VJs anymore. Yeah, and then and <laughs> yeah. then and then it's over. Yeah. Um, uh, but it was amazing because uh, years later, I've I, I joined the Sinatra Society at the nursing home. I would have the Frank Sinatra Appreciation Hour. Okay. And I would write fan letters to Frank Sinatra, and a friend of mine, actually, who knew Frank Sinatra, said, "Oh, you know, there's this VJ on MTV and." She's crazy about you, and she right. talks about you all the time. And I was in the hospital, and a huge—I uh, think it's right there. Oh yeah, uh, eight by ten 
of Frank Sinatra came, and the next day, a big wooden crate, and Frank Sinatra painted me a watercolor. He painted you a watercolor? It's amazing. <laughs> That's yes. crazy. I know. It and was, he was probably in his 80s at that point? Yes. The, well, yeah, he died at 80, yeah, in his early 80s in yeah. 1980, in 1998 he died. Wow. So this is his 100th year. He was born on December 15th. Uh, 1915. So you're a fan. Yeah, I'm a fan. Uh, yeah, a little bit of a fan. <laughs> yeah. But there's an interesting thing too about um, that sort of the people that came up in the you know in the 40s through the 60s who were hosting things on television. They weren't a generation raised on television, so mm-hmm. they still had sort of a showbiz. Uh, you know, have to multi-talented kind of thing where you might sing, but you might also have to present a show and you mm-hmm. also have to dance and act and do comedy sketches and all these sorts of variety show things, which is kind of a lost art now because mm-hmm. people specialize so much more or, or whatever the opposite of specializing is where they're on TV and can't do anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and that that's very unusual. And I think we're starting to wane probably in the early 90s. So I think that you definitely stood out as a VJ when you would, when you would watch you on MTV uh, which now makes sense. Why? Because uh, I knew those psychological tricks. <laughs> right. And also... Um, You're probably the only VJ with an advanced degree, I'm guessing. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was interesting. Uh, I was I was a couple years older and uh, than Spooky. Like the other, They were all in like their, I would say, like early to mid-20s. And yeah. I was in my late 20s. And, um, uh, and they were much more casual. Right. And, and I remember like certain VJs almost had like a sense of like proprietary fandom over okay. certain like, genres certain of music genres. or genres like? like they and I was kind of like oh you know yeah, I did I just felt like you know, the best thing is to broadcast and right. not narrow cast right. and kind of be I mean it was like when a cheesy band would come on right. um I felt like well you know what Hooray for them. They made a video and got it on way right. better than I ever did. Jesus Jones is doing well. <laughs> Jesus Jones or Fireho- oh, Firehouse. Fire, uh, Firehouse. Yeah, was, Firehouse. Yeah, Firehouse. Yeah, uh, was their Love of a Lifetime? Yes. Was that their song? Yeah, yeah. And, um, Firehose was good. Yeah, Firehose. Um, and also, the uh, it was kind of at the end of like the hair, hair brand right. era. And... Uh, so I would actually do my research because I was used to preparing for my job right. at the nursing home. And if you're going to interview there. someone, you should know something about them. Yeah, and I and also I um, I have a unbelievable memory. I have not exactly photographic, but I would right. say photogenic. So, so, my, so not quite Mary Lou Henner. No, actually, my sister and I are like, what the hell is Mary Lou Henner? Doing? <laughs> that happens to us all the time. Right. Actually, my sister Kate and I are entering the uh, Memory Olympics. Oh, nice. And I think one of the reasons that I, I think my memory is so strong is I always felt that your eyes looked dead if you were just reading a teleprompter. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And so I could actually just look at a page and almost take a picture of it mentally. Right. And then look at the camera and then read what was in my So you're brain. memorizing copy like that. Yes. And I would write it myself. I would work with a writer. Right. Because I felt like uh, I was so new. And also um, the other, my colleagues were all really into very specific genres. And I right. didn't have that. Right. So I just approached my job as a fan. Yeah, and you came across more like the news people, mm-hmm. which is a compliment, you know, <laughs> um, where it was where it had a little more gravitas mm-hmm. and did seem more knowledgeable, and that did stand out. You know, like when they'd send you to like spring break or something, oh it God. always seemed a little bit like is some is she reporting on something yeah. bad that happened? There? I know, like, I kind like, of felt like mutton dressed as a lamb a little bit, but it was it was really great fun, and then um, I wound up like dating this knucklehead that I am still crazy about um i dated wit crane from ugly kid joe oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. and we're still unbelievably tight and this I mean, was the cats in the cradle era yes of ugly kid yes joe, yeah. and they i hate everything about yes. you but the sad thing was their their biggest song was a cover so they yeah yeah, yeah. um they, that curse hit them <laughs> they, but they're it was really kind of funny um dating this California surfer knucklehead. Right, because you, do you consider yourself very East Coast? Yeah, very. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would never like, love New York. I love where I'm from. And he'd be like, uh, hey, Duff, is, um, is like New Hampshire a state? Like, <laughs> it's a state like, of mind. Have, it's, uh, have you read a book? Yeah. And he's like, no. And um, I remember one time uh, 
he just he, he was just hilarious like and he was oh it, and sometimes dating somebody with a with a drinking problem can be a lot of fun that's true they, yeah in yeah, hindsight booze, it's often fun yeah, yeah. <laughs> booze sounds can be a lot of fun yeah and i remember like one time saying you know what you know you are just such a great guy and you're so funny but and you know you always tell me how much you love me when you're hammered yeah. like you never tell me when you're normal right and he's like well that's easy because normally you're not that cool ah, which and you set yourself made up for that me one. love him even more <laughs> and i laughed my like, ass that's off. better than if you said i love you i know it was even better he just never let me down yeah. he was so consistent in being a knucklehead and i just adore him i just i talked to him at least once a week. So still. You're still, you're still in touch with a lot of the people. That yeah, you some met from great that friends. Time. I'm, yeah. I mean, actually, very tight with the crew. Yeah. Um, with my actually, just today, it's four in the afternoon, and I've probably I probably spoke to maybe six people that I worked with at MTV already <laughs> okay. today, and that's just a natural part of the day. Right, right, right. Um, uh, Jody Morlock, who did hair and makeup, uh, Gina Rossitano, who was the stage uh, manager, my producer. Uh, Angela Carbonetti, I spoke to today. Tabitha Soren. Oh yeah, yeah. Tab's great. She's doing amazing. Yeah, she's doing photography now. Yes, yeah, she has a big Coast, show, right? yeah. um, which I would highly recommend. Baseball photographs. Baseball, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well really done. Really great photographer. Well done, Ken. Try, yeah. try to learn. She's this um yeah. I would say I'm probably closest to Tabitha. Yeah. Well, she was the news person too. It makes person. sense that like you had probably similar uh, mentalities, or probably felt similar among the rest of the people. Yeah, I mean, there. it was just I think. Uh, we actually we, we came really close actually after we left because okay. our, our departments weren't really together but I spent most of the time with the crew right. with the technical crew and um, and it just seemed like that was a little bit of a destabilizing time because I came in I took over Martha Quinn's yes. shift yeah so you took over for the original VJ so this was like the this was almost like the second cast of Saturday Night Live yeah. it was like all this pressure uh -huh. for these people who sort of invented this format that mm -hmm. no one had seen before although uh, side note we were mentioning your brother is, was in a Boston band called Rods and Cones who mm -hmm. were very popular in the Boston area because they were on V66 which mm -hmm. was the local UHF uh, MTV rival which mm -hmm. is very strange um, so I mean aside from that local sort of blip it was MTV was kind of it and yeah. they sort of invented this format and also MTV did something great um, where they had the basement tapes yes where unsigned bands could send in it's their videos every Saturday videos. night or something and they yes. put them against each other and pretty much absolutely every band you know had a photo of themselves on railroad tracks yes railroad that tracks were very big that was the big <laughs> late 80s photo mm -hmm. and like uh, the 90s photo was like in a field yeah or like a flower field was the big 90s yeah. was the railroad tracks I then flowers yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah there's been a trajectory trajectory of that and you would uh, they they would have you host like you'd fill in i think i saw you host mtv raps once or something no i i actually i when i first got hired on mtv i hosted fade to black okay which was an r&b show oh, okay um and i hosted with todd one okay and um ted demi bless him in heaven was the oh, director yeah. and i this uh it was funny. I had dinner with Fab Five Freddy last oh, week, nice. and it was just so great to see Fab, because um, Fab was the original host of yes. Yo MTV Raps when it was on, like on Saturday nights, right? Like once and a week, once a week, yeah. and then it became a, a daily show in about '92. Yep. So in between um, that time, there was a weekly show called Fade to the Black. Okay, and, and that was um, more that was like hip hop and R and B stuff. Yes, hip hop and R and B, and it was kind of cool because I like you know got to like interview, uh, you know, Jermaine Jackson. Right. This would he has have been a son like named Jer Majesty. Jer Majesty. <laughs> yes, he has a, a quote when he was on the uh, UK version of Big Brother. Mm -hmm. He was telling uh, the other cast members about his kids, and he goes, "My son has a very special name." <laughs> and then he goes, "Your Majesty," and they were like, "That is quite the introduction because that is a very special name." Yeah, and uh, I know it's. I do collect people who name their children, children odd yeah. things. It's, yeah, it's a good collection. Yeah, um, but uh, I loved. I felt was like that, that, that was not my. To, was that was it, actually I love like like definitely like the sound of Philadelphia yeah. TSOP. I love. Right. Uh, um, 
you know, Larry Gamble right. and uh, Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes. Okay, so classic stuff. Classic, was more, more yeah. um, Al Green. Yeah. Actually went to Al Green's church, the full gospel tabernacle oh, wow. church in Memphis. So I like um, Barry White yeah. and Herb Albert. Actually, uh, well, he had a song at that time with Diamonds that Janet Jackson sang. That's around right. Around the same time, you, you were probably just starting at MTV. And Herb Albert is unbelievable. He's in his 70s. He's an, an accomplished artist. He yeah. started A&M Records uh, with, I think, Larry Moss. Yeah. And, what a smart um, guy. He's one of those guys we were talking earlier that kind of get in the industry as a performer and then kind of get how it works and Truly. Sort of unlock the business piece of it. Yes, like, he's a polymath. Yeah. And the way um, he was essentially self-educated and you know, he was a Russian Jew. Yeah. But everyone thinks he's Mexican right. because of the Tijuana Brass yeah. playing the horns. But I, I go to see him every year. And um, uh, early in the year when um, uh, George Clooney was getting married, yep. George and our old buddies, and... Uh, George comes up often on this show. He did. He's, well, <laughs> he's very funny and uh, has an unbelievable uh, body of work. And, oh, yeah. And, and what he's doing next in uh, uh, in television. I mean, he's taking it to the next level. Well, he's a guy that was on so many shows for so yes. long. And people are always From the shocked. Fats of Life. And, yes. you know, he was on the original ER comedy show. Yes. And then ER later. And, and the just, Talking Baby show. Yeah, uh, Baby Talk, yeah, with yes. Julia Duffy. The first season before mm-hmm. they recast with Scott Bayo. The only time <laughs> Scott Bayo replaced George Clooney ever. <laughs> yeah, it may happen again at some point. Um, but, you know, it just been around forever in these things. And, and it's amazing when you see those people who transitioned from television to be, you know, movie stars and, and do all these amazing things like that. Well, it was interesting that we were saying, again, how um, you have to really expand your talents, I think, right. in order to be a true entertainer. And we talk about that a lot. Like, you know, we're always like, you know, is it Frank Sinatra or Sammy? And George is always like, you know, for sheer talent, Sammy Davis could do everything. Really? And um, so for George's wedding, I convinced... Bill Murray and I, that we should actually perform. Okay. And but and I have a terrible voice, but the, I also knew that all I had to do was essentially get Murray to agree. Yeah. And people are going to be looking at him. He'll be yeah 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 yeah. <laughs> He's he bring out the bread and mustard. The ham is on the stage. Yeah. So um, we rehearsed for about five days in. That's dedication. In for yes. Way, yeah. No, we really worked hard. It was funny. We were out on our terrace and. It was, it's just amazing, um, just the fact that I'm, you know, that two of my best friends happen to be icons. Right, and, right. Uh, and where did uh, you meet them initially? Well, I met George through um, his cousin. Okay. And uh, I worked with his cousin, and he was like, you know, you would love right. my my cousin George, and George and I met and have been really, really tight, and. Uh, I would go to all these events with him because I'd be his wingman because, right. like, you know, I'm not going to jump on his lap when a camera yeah. comes around. Yeah. And also, having another chick makes every other woman, every every other woman, really competitive. So <laughs> okay. It was it was a good it yeah. was a, it was a good thing. So I introduced George to Bill, and they became really good friends. Yeah, they, have a, they seem to have a similar um, sort of wise ass sensibility. Yes, I imagine not they're anymore. Irish Weisenheimers. Yeah, and um. They did the fantastic Mr. Fox at yes. our farm. They filmed that. They recorded. Oh, did they really? Yes, that at our farm. Oh, I've seen the footage of that then on the DVD. Yes, the, the, so yes. that's yeah. Um, that's that's our house. And um, Wes Anderson wanted a place that was a real farm where he could right. actually um, incorporate all the sounds. So it's funny. Yeah. So I did all the female voices oh, until yeah. some ingenue came in and over. Yeah, the Meryl Streep. So it oh. was so funny. Like, like there's one scene where we're you know talking in a rocking chair, and they had to like animate a rocking chair because yeah, yeah. you could hear that on the, the creaking. <laughs> so George and Bill became really good friends. And when George was getting married, my husband was the best man. And so Billy and I were rehearsing. Uh, so we decided to do a medley of Herb Albert and the Carpenters. Very nice. Uh, what essentially, car- what Carpenter song? Did well, you we started off with. Uh, Herb Albert, this guy's in love with you. Okay, per- appropriate. And, and then uh, we went into um, the Karen uh, the Carpenters, uh, close to you. Okay, all right. So it, it's 
They still have the horns. Yeah. And then You didn't Bill, use the Rick Moranis parenthood arrangement. No, no, we, we actually <laughs> Bill arranged it. Bill really? was a Bill was a musician before he was um, a comedian and an I actor. Didn't know that. And it's amazing because again, he looks like he's just flying by the seat of his pants. Yeah. But he we rehearsed, he arranged. Right. And then when we got to Italy we met with the band and rehearsed. I mean he got this down. works really like like seamlessly to make it look effortless. Right. Which is the um, hardest thing to do. It's it is so incredible. So uh the night after um George did a great thing. They had the rehearsal dinner the day after the wedding. Yeah. Because they didn't want everyone to be all hung over right. at the wedding. That's so it was like the wild party after. Yeah. And Billy and I went up and um I had a uh, horns i bought a bunch of uh trumpets okay. off of ebay yeah and best place to buy mouth instruments <laughs> it was used <laughs> yep. and then um but we had a three-piece brass section so we didn't nice. it looked like we were faking it yeah, yeah, yeah. And it looked like we were actually playing and um it was just amazing and uh one of the best moments of my life so did you grow up i imagine watching snl and when yes. bill was on it and stuff and yeah and it's it's yeah it's funny because i met bill at this guy michael o'donohue yeah michael o'donohue the, was the original writer for snl uh was one of the original national lampoon writers yes he's sort of credited with giving snl that the edge when it first started yes yeah and uh so i knew michael and michael died of a it's a brain hemorrhage, a brain hemorrhage uh probably like around 94 95 yes and he wrote scrooged yes he wrote scrooged and um did uh, another one with Doug? What's the guy's name who wrote Animal House? Uh, oh yes, from National Lampoon. Um, Doug. Uh, Kenny. Kenny. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I met Billy when uh, Michael at Michael's funeral at Michael's okay. wake. Okay. And uh, have just been great. We actually we own a baseball team together. Oh nice. A couple of them. It's As you fun. do with your friends. I know. I mean, literally, <laughs> it costs less. To be a shareholder of this baseball team, which is in New England. Yeah. Um, uh, we own a, a team uh, called the Torrington Titans. And, what state uh, is that? In? It, it's in Connecticut. Oh, Connecticut. Okay. And the Brockton Rocks. Oh, yeah, the Brockton, Brockton Rocks. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love the... Um, Brockton's... I, weirdly, on this show, I've had guests... The most amount of guests who've been on the show have been from Brockton. That's, You're kidding. There's been like six people from Brockton on the show. And that doesn't include Rocky Marciano? No, Which Rocky is the reason Marciano. why they're called the that Brockton Rocks. That is why they're called the Rocks. Yep. The most amount of boxers have come from Brockton. And uh, Yes. Uh, well, so, uh, who is it? Uh, ha Haglin? Uh, yep. yep. Haglin? Yep. Haglin was from yeah. Brockton. It was a, a, a shoe town mm -hmm. that uh, yes. fell on hard times and then made boxers. Yes. <laughs> we can't I, make shoes. We'll make people who fight. It's pretty, it's it's, uh, it's been amazing. Um, I feel like it's a Nantucket sleigh ride working on this. It's a wooden bat league. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's It's been around for, I think this is our fifth season, and we're already outselling the Cape Cod League. Were you a big sports fan growing yes. up? Yes. Okay. I mean, my, I, I mean, I wanted to be Mars shot, except okay. not a racist. <laughs> Did you play yes. sports? And yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, uh, played baseball and uh skied taught skiing um i really do more independent sports right, rather than right. team sports not team sports would you um, come into the city a lot and go to games or yes yeah, so live for the mets okay and um uh i just love that baseball doesn't have a clock and yeah. it just unfolds and uh so it's it, so bill is the commissioner of fun for our league it's okay. called the futures That's collegiate important. baseball league and um uh, I'm actually going to go to the Vineyard. Uh, it's okay. opening weekend, uh, June 4th. Okay. Uh, next weekend. And uh, for Father's Day, Bill wanted to give out a uh, free vasectomy. Excellent. And the Father's Day, but the Catholic Church has shut us down. They would shut that yeah. down. They're very touchy, uh, no pun intended, <laughs> about uh, vasectomies. Mm -hmm. I don't know why or what it is, especially yeah. in, in the New England area. I know, especially with Catholics. Yeah, it's so. very, very strange. It was, but uh, it's it's been really great fun to come up with cockamamie ideas yeah and you and, have the means to sort of make these things happen which yeah, is crazy and it's also like it, it's essentially it's a non-profit we're just doing it yeah, just to have fun it's just and fun. you know it's our tickets are five dollars each which to me is so i i mean i grew up in boston which has become a ridiculous sports town where it's it's uh 
I just don't see it how it's fun anymore the mm-hmm. way that, because people are just so serious about it and it's uh, it's not a game. It's mm-hmm. a thing. And so when I see the sort of minor league teams, I'm like, oh, you know, if it was like this, I would go all the time. Like, it would seem more fun. Yeah. It, it, I love how, you know, every time, you know, in between innings, there's always some sort of entertainment. Right. Our, our goal uh, with this unbelievable... Uh, group of uh, the board of directors and the players they're all college athletes hoping to go into the major leagues right. like Steve Strasburg um, you know the pitcher who won the World Series yep, yep. he came up through Torrington Connecticut okay so it's funny like you can live in Torrington Connecticut you know where it's a very kind of depressed mill town right. you know as Makes you're being the scouted best athletes. <laughs> yeah or you could wind up playing for the Martha's Vineyard Sharks right. and living in some swanky billionaire's right. um, guest house. Um, but it's it's really fun, and I love uh, the humor of it. And yeah. just it's more it's sort of probably more like what going to games is like when you were growing up. Yes, as opposed exactly. To now where it's I don't know, it just seems more like a bar where people. Yeah, true, like a, true. Like a college bar or something. Yeah, and like 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 what's up with like food? Like, like oh, it's ridiculous. It's insane. Yeah, I. I can't, when I was uh, growing up, well, first of all, for the Red Sox, the, the Rat, which you mentioned mm-hmm. earlier, was the punk rock club. And that was across the street from Fenway Park. And they rented out their parking lot to people going to games. So inevitably, when the game got out, it was just a huge fight mm-hmm. uh, while people like drunk people came back. But I used to go to Celtics games all the time because it was after they had won championships and they didn't have any players anyone cared about. And you could just walk in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they wouldn't check tickets and wow. just walk in. And it was a lot more fun. You know, there wasn't like uh, these ridiculous food prices. They weren't getting lobsters yeah. and all this stuff. And so it was like, this is just kind of fun to hang out. You know, it's not like, a, oh, it's going to cost me $400. It's you know? true. Like, like yeah. I, uh, I went to the Rangers uh, with my son. My son's a goalie. And I love hockey. And uh, we wound up in these amazing seats. And they're like, oh, there's a buffet. I'm like, it looked like a wedding. But like, yeah. like at the hockey game, there was more food than at like my wedding. You're like, how long is this game going to be? <laughs> Why do we like, need to? They, st- yeah, there was a sushi bar and there was like lobsters. And it's just like, I remember going, when I used to go to Ranger games with my Uncle Freddie, he would eat peanuts with the shells on. Yeah. Because he's like, I miss too much hockey peeling them. And okay, I don't like, want to look down. Yeah, yeah exactly. The it's original so stadium buddy. And uh, <laughs> the stadium pal. Yeah. And, uh... It's just funny that, you know, now there's a... Well, it's like, you know what's ruining this five-star restaurant? No sporting event going on (laughs) at it. I think if we could somehow incorporate that. Uh, So you did Rock and Jock as well, didn't you? You did the first one, speaking of that. Yes. um, My friend Mitch Kozachowski, who I speak to all the time, he was um, the producer and the... um, He was actually the technical director, but a great, great guy. And I think I was... I think I was doing sideline reporting, and Anna Nicole Smith was the Batgirl. Yes, yeah. And um, uh, one of the things I wanted to do with this baseball league is actually uh, revive the Rock and Jock. Oh, MTV? Uh, at a, yeah, yeah um, you know, have it at one of our... Oh, uh, one of your events. At one of our events, yeah. And that'd be great. I think that'd be great fun. Because I think that stuff sort of fell by the wayside, because as if we were in this sort of transitional period at MTV when they started doing these more original programming, and the thing that literally changed the world, the real world, started in probably mm-hmm. the same year that you started on the yes. network. And that literally changed the world. It invented mm-hmm. the reality show format that... Uh, everywhere has Mm -hmm. and so you're seeing things like that mtv sports and rock and jock and the big picture and it's sort of becoming more of like a lifestyle branding thing Mm -hmm. and one of my favorite shows was house of style yes oh i know cindy is cindy's ex cindy's the one person that i'm probably closest to okay did you know any of the any of the people from that show first from modeling world i knew it was cindy uh yeah well cindy and i lived near each other um, we were neighbors in the West Village, and then uh, when she House of Style was done through the um, the news department. Okay. Because um, it started a series of specials. Before it started it was a specials, show. and actually, uh, Cindy wasn't the first host. It was uh, the different hosts, and then Cindy. Yeah, they had different people on each special. Yeah, I'm trying to think of who hosted the first one. I can't remember. But it's funny because Cindy is. Really a great girl, and we go away every year, and uh, we're going in June, um, this big group of us, and already I'm getting emails like, all right, 
or you know it, there's a specific set of problems as a middle-aged right. woman that like when your best friend is cindy crawford and you're going away with your family it's like yeah what do you wear and that I would was be like, pro- I think that would be just not even for middle-aged women, just for everybody <laughs> just for who's not Cindy Crawford. Well, I've said it's not really what we're wearing. It's yeah. what Cindy's going to wear. Right. So uh, we ordered her a burkini. Nice. Which is a full burka swimsuit. Excellent. Perfect. And uh, my friend was complaining that you could still see her eyes, and she's got very pretty eyes. That's like, a problem. Yeah, sunglasses. That's right. Did you see her episode of that show, Who Do You Think You Are, that she did? Oh, um, yeah, is it, of course. Family? Like, she's like some queen. She's like a Mayflower, yeah, yeah, yeah. like something from royalty. It was really, she actually went to New England, and it was very interesting. Yeah, um, Cindy actually is very, very bright, very quiet. Like, yeah. Um, For a Midwestern, she seems. Yes, like a, very low-key. Um, and her husband, uh, uh, Randy's great, at... at um, the wedding, uh, I kept teasing George, like, don't sit me at the loser table. Right, right. There was no loser there table There is no possible. loser table at George Clooney's wedding. It's <laughs> so, not possible. I, so, I, I got invited to a wedding on Block Island that was my uncle's, mm-hmm. and they put me at a table with everyone he forgot to put at a table. Oh, yeah. It was like people they invite, <laughs> like used to work with, they invited, didn't think would come, and they're like, how do you know? Uh, and I'm like, it's my uncle, and they're like, why are you sitting here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you kind of yeah, got, you, yeah. you got the loser table. So, so you requested no loser table. So I And I was sitting next to Cindy and uh, Cindy and George Cindy's husband Randy and George own a uh, a tequila company okay and all the money that uh, George makes for with this tequila company Casa Amigos goes directly to the Enough Project okay and uh, the Satellite Sentinel which they buy time on a satellite to monitor the border of north and south sudan wow so every time you do a shot you are doing a, you're not getting something that for with, a great ngo you're not getting that with sammy hagar's cabo Wabo. yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> you're just getting cirrhosis you're with just that. getting cirrhosis and and probably embarrassment to hide the bottles when yeah you throw them away <laughs> so you're you're growing up in new york and you're watching you know Saturday Night live but like what were the shows that really resonated with you so how many kids are in your family it's uh, uh four okay so a small irish catholic mm-hmm. family yes um, um, and you were in the middle or yeah i'm the second eldest okay so you you probably had a little bit of sway on the tv but yes. it was more of a negotiation it was always sports i mean i loved abc wild world of sports okay i, I mean love I, they had weird stuff on that yes i mean i love that memory in our family my parents were going out and they would like there, Barry White would be on right. the record player. Or there'd be scented candles. They're setting the mood. The lights would go down, and we'd have a fire. And I just loved watching like the highlight reels, especially right. like the sports highlight reels that they would um, marry to pop music. Right, right. Um, you Which know, like sort all the great fumbles. Yeah, like right. all the great fumbles to like Frank Sinatra's "That's Life." Right. And um, so I loved that. Um, I really love like uh, the very nostalgic uh, ABC after school specials. Yes. Like my sister Kate and I uh, will, you know, we'll watch them together What's on What's your YouTube. favorite one? Um, Stoned well, is the big one. I like that one. I, I really like the House Without a Christmas Tree. Yes. So you like the holiday specials yes. a little bit more. And that's, well, it's just so sad. Yeah. Like, Jason Robards is such a dick. Oh, yeah. Jason Robards is one of those guys that I always like watching, but he seems just like a sad old jerk in everything that in he's everything done. In everything that he's done. He's Even always something doing. Wicked This Way Comes might be my favorite thing he's ever done, but he's like amazing in Magnolia. Yes, sort of playing yes, yes, yes. Um, There's one called uh, "My Dad Lives." My father lives in a downtown okay, hotel. Okay, I just saw that. <laughs> oh, yes, I know. Was that a so Jason Robards' vehicle I as well? I think so. Yeah, we were talking about Stone Pillow earlier. Yeah. <laughs> the Lucille Ball one. <laughs> yeah, we don't. I think that generation has missed these sort of scare films. <laughs> I don't know how effective they were. I also really loved uh, Angel Dusted with Helen Hunt. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Crashing through a window. Yeah, that was great. Um, Would you watch those sort of with a sense of irony growing up? Or yeah, well. Um, I come from a big family, a long line of Weisenheimers, yeah. and um, like to show any emotion, you were immediately pummeled. Oh, yeah. So you had to like have this like like this like very thick undercoating that they cover battleships with, right. so barnacles don't like before you'd watch anything. Like you couldn't get a lump in your throat, or right. you have to make fun of it to sort yes. of to sort of counteract. This, <laughs> this is stupid. Yeah, yeah. I make it sound like Lord of the Flies, but. Yeah. It was like that. And I like my sister and I love like Blackula and Let's okay. Kill Uncle. Um, some Did great you ever go to the old 42nd Street when you were growing up? Yeah. I mean, all the time happening? when I was 
15, uh, when I was in high school, I would come in every Wednesday for, um, I would go to the theater all the time. And see those exploitation movies? Well, no, no, I'd go to the Broadway. Okay. I'd go, I'd go I to the say, shows. Yeah. But like, I remember going to see Al, um, American Buffalo with Al Pacino. Okay, yeah, And yeah. the father from the Waltons yes. was Ralph White. Yes. Yep. Was actually sitting next to me and then he went outside to smoke a cigarette. And it was just like um, interesting living. I grew up 13 miles from New York City, right. so very close. And so did you get kind of, um, not blasé, but was it difficult to be starstruck because you were sort of running No, I just? actually remember the first time going to MTV and uh, when I was going to do actually my screen test yep. and I on walked, the Tuesday after you on the Tuesday after, and I walked in and uh, uh, Colin Quinn yep was, he was there doing remote control at the time remote control and he was so funny and um, and he was like oh look at this woman I wonder what she's doing <laughs> and um, it happened to be there was a book that they were doing called 24 hours in America. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I actually happened to like walk in and at the moment when they were taking a photo uh, of, at MTV. Before. Perfect timing. And um, I remember being somewhat struck. I, I'm uh, friendly with Colin and he still, uh, I'm still starstruck by him because he's he is a massive talent. Oh, yeah. And had you seen him do stand up or know of his yes, stuff before? And then? I mean, I've actually seen it. He's done amazing shows. Oh, yeah. Uh, the one that Seinfeld directed. Yes. And the one, um, Sanctifying Grace, yep. which was a beautiful. Um, Another SNL alum as well. <laughs> yes, I know. He's so great. And then um, it was, uh, so I was somewhat kind of starstruck seeing like the presenters. Right. But not necessarily with the musicians because they were all so new. Right. So, so they didn't have that sort of. Yeah. Like, but it was just like. Gravitas. Uh, yeah, but I had the admiration because they were there right, and right. you know they made something that i didn't and i always felt like my brother would always say oh some of those vjs act like they wrote directed and starred in those videos right. and so i always felt like you know i'm never gonna have that i never felt that way but i never wanted to come across in anything other than like like Check no this matter really what cool thing out you, that you someone did else it. did yeah yeah, yeah, yeah you did it although i did get in trouble with a mariah carey i was like every once in a while an amazing voice comes together in a story with a video and it's just knocks it out of the park. But until that happens, yes. here's that video is rush rush yeah. with Paula Abdul and Keanu Reeves. <laughs> the one where she dances with the uh, animated cat. Oh yes. Two steps forward, two yeah. steps back. You're so I good. It was weird. Cause she was like opposites attract. I'm like, you're saying the opposite of you is an animated cat. That's very strange. I know. It's just, um, the, like, songs don't have to make sense. No, absolutely not. In fact, the less sense they make, the more people enjoy them. I always like when Mariah Carey first came out, She for years it was like, she was a backup singer for Brenda K. Starr. <laughs> <laughs> and now people will be like, who, who is Brenda K. Starr? And that you could, it would only shoot her on one side of her face. Yes, yes. I was in a lot of videos as a video vixen before. Before you were a VJ? Before a VJ, yes. How, what, which uh, videos were you in? <laughs> I think a new kids on the block. Oh, which uh, video? they fascinate a, me. Yes, a lot of um, uh, hip hop videos. Okay. Uh, I think Heavy D, Special K. Oh, like now that we found love. Yes. Uh, yeah. um, uh, Keith Sweat. Did you ever have to uh, introduce a video that you were in? No, they never were. <laughs> at that point, no. They were out of the rotation. They were, they were, they were out of rotation. Um, and uh, I don't think I would have actually, if that happened, I don't think I actually ever uh, cop to it. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. think that would have been weird. Or if anyone called you, says, that, it's not me. I yeah, don't know yeah, what that is. Cheryl, Pepsi, Riley. I did a bunch of them. I did a lot of a lot of videos. And then um, I was dating Dwight Yoakam, that, that oh, yeah, country yeah. singer. Yep. And uh, I was in, like, it, I was like, yeah, I can't be in one of your videos. Right, right. It's, it's just, too much. It's too, it, yeah. It's, you know, it, it, it would, it's... It, it is you are so like such a masterful musician right. like you don't want me tainting this in any way so with your ability to memorize stuff and and clearly you're you're naturally inclined to be a performer you've done some acting stuff but that didn't seem like the path that was that interesting oh have you ever seen anything i'm in i mean i have a few I, things it looks like i've got dutch i could have dutch elm disease i am absolutely wooden. so wooden i mean i Did you just freeze up or yeah i'm i'm 
very comfortable being myself. Yeah, yeah. And you were always uh, like a great talk show guest. Like you seem like a person they wouldn't pre-interview. Like yeah, you seem like that kind of. They always pre-interview you. But, uh, uh, but the great thing is if you get somebody who listens, like David right. Letterman, who listens and you can play with. Um, but actually, it was I did a movie. I think it was called Twenty Ninth Street, and it was like my first big. Uh, role where Did I played. Did you get that through modeling, or had you auditioned the, it, to be an actor? I had auditioned. Uh, uh, you know, I read for it for the director, and I wound up getting this part. And I was in LA, and I was driving back from the studio because I had to do some looping. And I was like, "What is it about that movie?" I was like, "I know, that's the worst movie I ever <laughs> saw in my life. It's terrible. I better get a new job before I'm yeah. box office poison." So I knew that movie was going to be coming out in like November, right? And I was like. Okay, what's in New York? Okay, Very small. Yeah, window. yeah. Okay, there's. I've, I've, I've got to get something now before right. anybody sees this right, movie right. and sees how terrible I am. So uh, there was like soap operas, but then again, that's a totally different. Like I think that's such a specific group of people that can do that kind yeah, of. Yeah. Plus, thing. I don't have the mug for it. Like, oh. yeah, you know. And um, but I, I, I was like, no. And Saturday Night Live, mm, but uh, I was like MTV. That's that. So that's why. I, that's why okay. I sent in the video to MTV. And it's smart. That's a very good process of elimination, sort of. Give. Yeah, well, I wanted to approach. see what was available. Yeah, there's game shows, and I yeah. wasn't going to be a game. There was no female letters. game show yeah. hosts. Um, and uh, so I really, you know, I knew that I wanted to have a new job before right. this came out. Right. And of course, the movie came and went, and nobody no ever one, noticed. Yeah. But you I hedged knew. Your bet, though, yeah, but yeah. I, yeah, I, I knew it was horrible. Um, and uh, but the funny thing is, is that. Uh, when uh, Dumb and Dumber, when I read the yep. script for Dumb and Dumber, uh, I had bec- grown more comfortable in front of the camera. Yeah. And I, when I read it, it was originally called The Power Tool is Not a Toy. Excellent. And it was a, it was going to be an $800,000 movie, a yeah. very small movie. And so as soon as I read it, it was so funny on the page that I um, called the writer and just was like, this is hilarious. Yeah. And I happened to be in LA and we met, I met Peter Farrelly and yep. we became great friends. Another and I New was Englander. like, I will, yeah, he's actually another from uh, Rhode Island. I was like, I will, I will just ask everybody. So I asked like all my um, actor buddies to do this. And yeah, yeah. like I was dating Chris Farley at the time and I couldn't get anybody to do it. Yeah. Um, and originally I was going to play the main role the Laura, of Mary. The, yeah, the Lauren Holly role. role. And then, Jim Carrey um, came out with uh, Ace, Ace Ventura, Ventura. Pepper yep. Tech, which blew up. Yeah, that and was. He signed... And that was a small movie that nobody thought was gonna. Exactly. It had an animated series. It was so popular. <laughs> He's um, uh, so he wound up signing on, and then he wanted. Lauren. He Lauren was much they were more. Or something. Was I think they after? were. I think they were. Um, Courting? Definitely, she was. <laughs> she was more his type. Physically. Yeah. Okay. I see. So uh, I was like. I'll do cat. I'll do right. craft services. Like right. I just I'm want to so be glad there. it's yeah. yeah. And uh, so it was very sweet. They were like, "Well, you've been such a good sport about it. Listen, we'll give you like a percentage point." Oh, nice. And um, nothing will come of it. Yeah, and that's exactly. <laughs> yeah. I was like, "You don't have to do this. Yeah, yeah. I'm just over the moon." So they gave me literally a role of a man, one of the bad guys, oh, with this Mike yeah, Starr. Yeah, yeah. And um, so I wound up. Um, you know, having a ball, and I was I was filming TV Nation at the same time, but it was so great. And then it, who would have thought that it? Yeah, blew I mean up? that movie is just like the. All their movies are such huge cult hit. Like they're the quote movies that but like they people were, bond over the quoting of the, their movies. I know, but you know, Peter and his brother Bobby were really struggling. They were selling round beach towels in yeah. Venice. Um, and uh, so it was really just so fantastic that they wound up. Uh, success couldn't have happened to a better group of guys. And they're guys that, like, when you when you hear them talk about their movies, every role is someone they know. Yes. Like, every person in the background, they're like, I grew up with him, he's a guy I went to camp with. Like, they just just stack the movies with everyone they know. True, it's like... Um, which they, is such a great indicator. But they always have hockey players. Yep. Uh, oh, former Red Sox. Yes, they Roger always they, they have, like, because they want the people that they want to meet. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Bill Murray's always in them. 
Yep. And uh, as well, he should be. And Bill Murray's movies. in the second one in in Dumb and Dumber. Dumb and Dumber, I Dumber still have not 2. Seen that. Oh. Okay. It's pretty funny because I was at his house and I was said, "Oh, I was just um, for Dumb and Dumber two. I still owned a porn. Right, <laughs> so right, I right. had a, and then um, which was amazing. MTV hired me back twenty years later. <laughs> To Did go, you ever think that? no, I had no idea. You know, I'm like, you know, by 52, and I was going back to MTV, and it was amazing. What was it like walking back in there? Did it? Well, I did it on location. Okay. And it was so similar. We had yeah. a conversation. I was always pretty much fairly uh, self-contained because right. I could write every, you know, right. You're I, approaching more like a news story. Yeah. So I knew how to. So no producer came. Right. Um, and I went on set, and it was just amazing because, you know, I was on MTV when I filmed the first one, right. and uh, I was back. Ba- yeah, <laughs> I was back, and um, twenty years ago for the first Dumb and Dumber, Jim Carrey, uh, who is exactly the way he is on in really, he's yeah. just funny and charming, and just will go for the laugh, and he is so sweet and really thoughtful, and uh, I would say. Very philosophical. Right. But he kept falling down like and, and grabbing his stomach and everybody thought he was joking. And I'm a trained community emergency response right. team and I was like, Are you okay? And he's like, No. But nobody would believe him. Right. So the meat wagon comes and I was like, Where does it hurt? And I was like, if it's if it's here, it, it could be your either your appendix if it's low, yeah. but it's by your cojones or it's and it was his gallbladder. Oh. So I was like You have gallstones? And uh, I said, when they take out your gallstones, will you give them to me? Okay. So as they're wheeling him in, he's like, save my gallstones for Duff. So then I went back to see him in the hospital. And actually, this was kind of cute. Lauren Holly was dressed up as like a total sexy nurse. Oh, like, very nice. Like really slutty sexy nurse. And he had a huge screen TV and he was watching his operation. He's an interesting guy. Okay. And I was like, all right, fork over the Yeah, I want gallstones. them gallstones. And actually, I have it. I, ha- I had it set. And <laughs> in a ring or something? Yeah, or it's an appendant. Oh, very yeah, nice. Yeah, I'll show it. And I wore it to when I interviewed Jim. And I was like, does this look familiar? <laughs> this was you, inside this you. <laughs> you are a human oyster. Wow. And uh, it looked like malachite. Oh, very weird. Yeah, he had three. And uh, so... One big one, and then he gave one to Lauren. Oh, nice. Yeah, I was nice. going to make her earrings, but, yeah, but she it didn't last that long. Plan. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't so, last long at all. So you're collecting pieces of celebrities. I um, thought it would be good to open up a, like, like a museum of celebrity used parts. Yeah, uh, people would go to that. Yeah. I mean, they would happily go to that. I think that would be more what people would want to see than anything else. You know, when... Um, uh, when I was on TV Nation, uh, we did a story about the National Endowment for the Arts. Yes, and, having their funding removed. Yes, yes, and the NEA and NEH. And um, the American taxpayer spends about, of all their tax bill. It's like about 70 cents a year. Or 80 something. cents. Yeah. Um, but we spend, as a country, more money on military marching bands than we do on actually publicly funded art. Yeah, which and is crazy. So it's, it was really a fun story to kind of tell the story of what would uh, the art landscape be in America right. if we only had Corporate. privately funded. <laughs> right. So I went to like Coke World and I went to Kentucky Fried Museum, Kentucky Fried Chicken Museum. And all the military museums. Yes, right? the, the Museum things. of Chemical Warfare. And Fun for the whole family. It was funny, but we, I, we, I really got into it, like the Beer Can Museum. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then I was like, we, we actually... Because some of those museums, like some of the things we're finding, it's like, okay, we had to like essentially make parameters and it was like would you rather want to see a pig drive a car right. or go watch angels in america right 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 and i was so wanting to go these two things the pig yeah. driving the car so we couldn't actually show the really funny like museums we had to kind of right, keep right. it because it's like a three minute yeah. story yeah so tv nation is a show that i really loved and it I think it was a summer replacement series on yes, Fox. It was. Yes, it was. Yes, probably. Yes, uh, and it was Michael Moore. It was right mm-hmm. after he had done Roger and Me, mm-hmm. uh, and it was essentially like a proto Daily Show for yes. people that don't know. And uh, you had Louis Theroux was the first thing I ever saw him on. Mm-hmm. Um, Gene Garofalo and 
it was a fantastic show. It was amazing. It was, uh, yeah, it was a summer replacement show, and I... And on Fox, of all things. I know. A, it was a amazing. A left-leaning show talking about corporate greed so much. It was some of the things that we did. I actually got that job by writing letters. The same way that I sent in um, a videotape to MTV, I wrote a letter to Michael Moore when I heard that he was doing a show. Okay. And I wrote a letter to the head of NBC, which is, uh, I think maybe Warren Littlefield, the head of Tri Sony TriStar. And I was like, congratulations, this guy's a talent. Right. You know, you I him. wish you all the best. This is a show. And I wasn't lazy. I didn't just write the same note yeah. to three people. And apparently Michael said that he was in a meeting and they're like, oh, we got this note. And three people opened up and showed that they got these letters. Right, they're right. like, person must really want a job she's very enthusiastic about this so i met michael moore at the howard johnson's in times square nice and Rest i've actually peace, howard been on every show that he because the awful truth the was awful bravo truth. after that I yes think. Yep. but um the first season was so crazy we created something called tv nation day okay where we actually hired a lobbyist and had yes i remember this uh thing. We had August 18th announced as TV Nation Day, and I had to go to um, a hospital, and the first baby born was the TV, was the TV Nation, Nation baby. baby and it was probably 20 now. Yeah, I know. It's so crazy. Let's hunt down the TV Nation and, baby. And um, you know, we gave him a salami from Katz's Deli yep. <laughs> and like a club and all these crazy things. And um, I would, it was... So crazy. Then we had we closed down. We actually got all of the um, in Fishkill, New York. It became TV Nation Day, and that was where they nice. closed the banks and we oh, closed right. the, the bank holiday. Yes, and we had a parade, and it was so out there. It was but it really made really great. interesting points though too. And I think that like the one of the segments you, I'm pretty sure you did the segment that sticks with me is when. They were people buying AIDS patients. Yes, life the viaticals. Yeah, which the... is that is one of the craziest things I've ever heard in my life. And you're able to present a thing like that, which is horrifying, mm -hmm. but in a funny way. Which... And also, I thought you know I am a devout Catholic. I'm a hospice chaplain. I'm a yeah. trained chaplain. And uh, uh, the word viatical, the viatical insurance um, is where. Um, I have, say I have a life insurance policy and it's for, say, $500,000. Right. You, as an investor, can give me $300,000 yeah. and take it right there. It's like a bail bondsman. Almost. Yes. Yeah. And then you can take your mother, like, you know, and it was mainly um, AIDS patients. Yep. And I remember interviewing the guy and he's like, listen, the great thing is there's no cure. So, I mean, you can't go wrong. And I was like, well, you investment. can yeah. really go wrong morally. And um, it was funny. I was just talking to a buddy of mine. And I remember I had to ask some really tough questions. Right, because that was one of the more serious stories. Really serious. Show. And it was also, uh, I had to ask questions that I was not comfortable. And so I would actually write the question on a cake. So <laughs> I would actually, because well, I had to get the question yeah, out. Yeah, so yeah. I would go to a bakery in whatever town we were, and I would be like, okay, how do you morally justify this? And then I just give him the, Hand cake, him the cake, and he'd have to read it and oh, tell that's me. It's a shame that the, that part isn't in the segment. <laughs> I think it, there, it there, the... there, maybe there's a shot of the cake. Yeah, because everyone likes cake. Everyone likes cake, yeah. and also I, you know, people usually need, you know, something to kind of fire them up in the afternoon. Right. Um, but you know, it was interesting. The people viatical comes from the viaticum, which is the. Uh, communion that during the Crusades the mm -hmm. priest would give to the uh, Crusaders fighting um, uh, to dominate Christianity all over the world. So I thought that that was kind of an interesting history. And one of the things that I learned was like they were like, listen, we can go into cancer, right. we can go into you know ALS and all these. Like Heart just problems. think of all yeah. of these. It's a growing things. business. It is a growing business, and. Um, he was just saying, like, you know, and there's no cure on the horizon, so you really... And I said, well, how do you know? And he said, it's, well, you know, because this was before the world was wired. Right. So the way... So say I, you own my life insurance policy, right. and you've given me $350,000, you're, but you're going to make... 
Oh, and you're happy. You, you get you, cash. You, What's you, the problem? Um, so the way it is, the person had to send you a postcard every month. Like someone being held for ransom. Yes. So you got <laughs> essentially a note that that was all the company would give you, a, you know, a stack. Not dead yet. Yes. Essentially, you know, and then your job was once a, once a month to put that in the post. And then you would get it. And then when you didn't get a, a postcard for a few months. Cash it in. That's when you would cash in. That I just... It's so weird to me that some of that stuff seems so fringy and crazy then that I feel like the world has grown into that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. more. And it seems more okay to do that kind of thing now. Yeah, I loved when um, uh, we did a thing where we uh, we had love night for hate groups. Yes. So we had like the gay men's uh, choir go sing to all of... uh, the people who hated them the most. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we would have, like, you know, Baptist choirs singing to the Ku Klux Klan. And we just really found hate groups. And it's funny, I'm very, very close to everybody on that show. Michael, I mean, because it was so extraordinary and so brave. I mean... What you guys got away with on that show was amazing. I mean, this is a primetime network show that has a very, very clear point of view and a message and are presenting these stories that would, wouldn't even get covered on a, on a mainstream news program. Mm-hmm. And it's it's mostly being watched in the summer by kids or teenagers because mm-hmm. they're off school yes. and they're watching so much more TV. He was on it Friday night. Yeah, and it, it, it definitely made an impact, I think, with people who see that kind of thing because television, when you stumble on these things and you get that spoonful of sugar that helps a message get through is one of the most powerful tools there is for, mm-hmm. for things. And especially where people didn't have the internet to go, well, let me yes. see if that's true, or let me find something that counteracts that so I can make myself feel better. Yes, and yes. And that sort of thing. Um, I've just um, just wrote my latest book. and uh, This is the third book? This is my... Because you did the cookbook? Uh, and then in the, the memoir. So this memoir. is a book called How to Live in Chronic Pain Without Turning into a Chronic Pain in the Ass. Oh, very nice. Um, but I also have another book, The Hockey Mom's Guide oh, to yeah. Life. Uh, but I didn't... I'm holding... I'm going to publish the pain one and then the hockey one. Okay. I didn't want to f- um, flip them over, but my editor is somebody who I worked with at TV Nation, oh, actually wow. two people. And uh, it's just, it was so much fun because, you know, we it was essentially a race because we had to get the satellite, we had to get the tape to NBC. And sometimes it would be like within like a minute because yeah. Michael was always tweaking and... Um, I remember, so that was the Summer Replacement Series, and we were nominated and won Best Information Series. We won the Emmy, and it was incredible, and we got canceled the next day. Yeah. And then... Obviously. I think uh, NBC picked us up and then canceled us. I think we went... uh, And then eventually the BBC and the Canadian Broadcasting uh, funded it, and then it kind of went to the awful truth. Right. um, Umbrella. But it's funny because my when uh, when we were working on TV Nation, uh, I had a beach house uh, with some people from MTV and some people from TV Nation, <laughs> and my buddy was dating You're the crossover Liz Winstead. Oh yeah, yeah. The and Daily Show creator Liz Winstead. So when we were all working on TV Nation, she was developing uh, the Daily Show, and John Stewart, who Actually, he was the one who gave me all the gum, gummy bear, gummy oh, nice. drops. And he was uh, doing a ton of stuff on MTV at that time. Yeah, he had a great show called You Wrote you It, You Watch, watch it, it, which is what the state came out of. Yes. They would, I actually wrote a story into You Wrote It, You oh, Watch you It. Oh, you did? Said, yes, about finding a, a dead body in my neighborhood. Wow. Um, but I loved that show, and he had the Jon Stewart show, and he was doing a lot of stuff on House of Style as well, weirdly. That's right, and I was the first guest on every single one of Jon's shows. Yes, because he had the syndicated show that replaced Arsenio mm-hmm. Hall later, yes. which was a great show. Um, and I loved his MTV show. It was fantastic. His, uh, you know, he is, again, so immensely likable. Yeah. Um, and he had Howard Feller, uh, announcer Howard Feller. I know. <laughs> He's such a nut, right? Uh, it's funny. The same uh, team that we all worked with at MTV have been working with John for 20 years years so it's ama- like, such loyalty everything you've said about how being in touch with still and working with these people still it's really the exception rather than the rule and it's interesting how you've you stuck with all these people for so long yeah and they stuck with me well it's true yeah and uh when uh george when george was getting married he 
you know, and he has a beautiful sister, and it's very difficult, I think, to be George Clooney's sister. I would imagine. Your mother, George's mom, is Miss Kentucky, yeah. and his father was, you know, this newscaster. Was Rosemary and Clooney his aunt? His aunt, yes. Yeah. So uh, George's sister, who's a private citizen, I just thought, oh, gosh, it must... Civilian. Uh, we're going to, like, <laughs> let's... like. Let, we, we've got to we've got to buy some dresses because yeah. I just imagined like I was just getting the monkey squirts thinking about like what I'm gonna have to wear and I'm right. like yeah and nobody at cares least about Cindy me. Lisa Crawford wasn't coming. Oh no, she was. Coming. Yes, yeah. that's I know. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I wanted uh, George's sister to feel beautiful and comfortable because this was a lot of pressure. Her right. life was changing as well, and um, I also wanted her to get makeup and hair. But I also didn't want her to feel judged in any right. way. And so I mentioned this to John and to my Jody. And he, and then, like, without a beat, come and use my studio. <laughs> and it was just so beautiful yeah. that, like, that uh, John Stewart opened up his hair and makeup so I could help this middle-aged woman who is from Kentucky that's never right. had her hair done, never had her makeup done. And not only that, like... They bought her everything in the makeup kit, like yeah. just good people. Like, which seems rare. Like that's amazing. And these seem less like people that you worked with, and more like people that you like went to college with. Or yes, something. like you. See Maybe that, I that feel more. that's that's true because we were all starting out yeah. and on a level playing field. We were all kind of rookies and and sort of inventing this stuff as well. I mean, all the sorts of genres were basically new. I mean, you were only the second generation of MTV VJs these sort of comedic news programs mm -hmm. hadn't really been done. I mean, pieces of them had been some SNL, you know, mm -hmm. but this was all new. And so you didn't have the expectations, I guess, of what was going into it. So that probably makes you feel closer to these people because you're sort of inventing this. True. I, and also, I think what I've noticed, and in, 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 as you're saying this, Ken, it's a, like, if you, if you don't give up, you'll eventually get there. And yeah. I just saw like how this group of people that I really admired, the funniest, most thoughtful group, like still just so generous. Yeah. And uh, you know, twenty plus years um, together, but they are so inspiring to me. And uh, I think their generosity has truly been like a beacon. It's amazing to see good people get mm -hmm. rewarded. Yeah. Because I think so much in the world now, especially the entertainment industry, just like sociopathic jerks mm -hmm. will seem to like yeah. keep doing well. And you're like, oh god, there's no hope for people who are actually decent human beings. But there is, and it's it's nice to see that. And, yes. and, and that they don't change as people, like they they have more uh, means to help more people. Yes. You know, with like the, the tequila with Clooney and yeah. and you know, John Stewart doing it. And it's amazing that yeah, they John do this. Stewart has like um i think one of i think the principles that we all share is that um if you do something like uh for someone else if you if you talk about it it doesn't count right and I then just, you're not doing it, yeah, do yeah, it. You're, and, and so it's just um i'm a great uh devotee of epictetus who is the father of stoic philosophy mm -hmm. and the stoics believe that we can't control what happens to us. We can only control how we respond. Right. And that's just been, I think, uh, truly uh, guiding my morality is just uh, the fact that I can't control what's going to happen, but I can control how I'm going to react to it and how I can respond and how I can maybe do this with grace. Which is very interesting for someone raised Catholic. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very different... Yeah. It's, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, you, you take faith where you can find yes, it. Yes, absolutely. Um, but I see uh, that, that morality and that generosity and that humility. It's funny. Uh, I find I'm not really invested in social media. Mm -hmm. And it's so immodest. Yeah. And I think if I just wanted to read boasts, I could just read my journal. Yeah. Like if I want yeah. to hear bragging and boast. But um, uh, so I don't do a tremendous amount of, of social media. And uh, what I see with my friends like Jon Stewart and people who have really at the pinnacle, like you couldn't get any better than what John yeah. or what George were doing. It's funny because I grew up with Jimmy Gandolfini. Oh, yeah, yeah. We went to junior high and high school together and I remember my yearbook 
he wrote, Duff, I'll see you on Broadway. And I'm thinking, unless they build a new Broadway in the <laughs> right, middle of Park Ridge, right. New Jersey, I won't be seeing you Telling anywhere. Just about the street or the actual building? <laughs> I know. Yeah. And uh, it was very interesting because, again, Jimmy was a great guy and success in no way changed him. Yeah. But he never enjoyed it. Like, right. he, I mean, I would say he enjoyed it in his own way, which was a very grouchy not grouchy but like like begrudgingly like i like i'm missing out on a part of my life because i have to no i think he loved what he did but he was very shy so i he think like the things that came with it yes he loved doing it right and again he was a guy that would literally give everybody on the set an envelope yeah and there'd be a lot of zeros. Yeah. And he, again, was a one-man conga line of generosity. Uh, well, there and, are those people who go, look, I have enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah, true. <laughs> it's rare, but there yeah. are some people who are like... And I feel like, you know, they're, they're really trying to... Uh, uh, I think there is a sense of gratitude. And right. when I'm, you're making me kind of reflect on the people that I've kind of come up with. Right. And uh, I kind of... Uh, when I was really, I just signed like a three uh, movie deal at um, Disney um, and I got really sick and I just think, well, thank God for sarcoidosis because it saved the world from a from bunch of Disney crappy movies, movies from where <laughs> Disney, three more Disney movies. Toys that, two and three. Oh, no, I mean, no, my, the Disney movies I did were like, so they're. I would not watch them if they were screening on my own corny. Were they Disney Channel movies? No, they or were Disney. Full like, Disney movies. Blank check. Oh, blank check. Yes, yes, like, yes. I remember blank horrible. check. Horrible. Nothing, nothing made sense. So um, I kind of, for a couple years, uh, stopped working. Right. and But actually kept working on TV Nation. And, and Awful Truth. You were and, still on. And Awful Truth and, and Revlon. But I really couldn't. I couldn't pass a physical. Right. So, so I couldn't, couldn't get insurance. Mm-mm. So I couldn't. Well, I couldn't be insured. To be a part of a show, right? So, uh, if you know, I, like I had the way that they pay farmers not to farm, right? I would make these deals to do a TV show, <laughs> right. like to do uh, to do a talk show, and I just could never fulfill it because right. I couldn't pass that. So that was kind of interesting because I w- really spent more time writing, and that's and when you wrote the first book. Right? Wrote the first book, and then wrote the second book, and um, I write. Uh, I write for the Times, and I have a I had a uh, weekly column in the New York Daily News, which is a lot better than making blank check. Part yeah, yeah, two. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. <laughs> I do love uh, being alone and writing and thinking and just like, like just today. You're completely today. in control. Yeah, I was like, okay, I, you were in my apartment, and uh, my son and I were coming up from school, and I looked at him, and he. As he, as he exited on the third floor, he was like, old people. <laughs> and, 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 I, and he was just like, I have no sense of smell. He's like, this apartment smells like old people. I didn't our, notice our, that. Our, 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 well, there's a lot of old people. Okay. So then I looked up, why do old people smell? Right. And uh, this is kind of interesting. Maybe that's, no. have you always never had sen- no sense of smell? I lost it through chemo. Oh, okay. Because um, I was going to say, maybe that's why it was easier for you to work yeah, in the uh, nursing home. Nursing home. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, uh, it does come in handy. Yeah. It definitely comes in handy as a hospice chaplain. Yeah, oh, absolutely. So old people smell kicks in, and what it is, it's called nonial odor. And it's essentially an off gas because you're, as you age, you become less moisturized right so you essentially you're turning into human jerky yeah so non odor but the weird thing is it kicks in at 40. that's not that old so essentially jennifer lopez has been smelling like an old lady yeah for seven years uh, that's if you look when her branded perfume came out <laughs> yeah that's probably it's the same year so it <laughs> makes she perfect a, sense and benedict cumberbatch is like 11 months away from smelling like an so old person smell them now before it's too <laughs> before it's late he needs late. to bottle that stuff <laughs> Yeah. Did you ever watch the things that the people that you came up with are in? Like, did you watch The Sopranos? Did you watch? Oh the Daily yes, Show? yes. Um, Is it hard to get into them? No. Oh, well, actually, I worked at HBO when I um, uh, I was I had a deal at MTV and they for a long time. Yeah. 
the guys at MTV, I mean, I just felt like as much as I loved it, it was really skewing way younger. Yeah. And it just, I just didn't fit. That's when tweens were kind of yes. invented towards the tail end of that. Yeah. And I was like, come on. I'm, I'm, I'm eight years away from smelling like an old person. I couldn't believe how long Kurt Loder yeah. hung on there. <laughs> Talk about really smelling <laughs> like him. Um, he had this like senior statesman. Right. Um, but uh, so when I got the offer to, do TV Nation. Uh, the big cheeses at MTV were more than happy to wish me well and right. wish me luck. And actually, I'm still great friends with them. I mean, I just saw Tom Freston um, at dinner. Uh, so I left to do TV Nation, and then I got hired to, for um, for HBO, and I was with okay. HBO for about 15 years. So I did all of the red carpet and all yep. the interior stuff. But I loved... Um, the Sopranos and you know it was just funny because you know I did all the like musicals with Jimmy I was yeah. a cheerleader like Jimmy was like never want Jimmy um, uh, would never want to do any press yeah and I was like Gandolfini <laughs> I have pictures of you in my cheerleading uniform yeah so <laughs> we can do this the hard way <laughs> or the, um He's and, a guy that I always wish did more comedies. Like he's so great and yes. in the loop. He's yes, amazing in that movie. I know. And he seemed like a you know he get, would get cast as the heavy, but he was really funny. He was really funny, and um, in our high school, he was voted best looking, and I was voted class clown. Oh, nice. Which goes to show you that I went to one ugly high school. <laughs> <laughs> Mine um, might have had you beat. <laughs> uh, where'd you go to high school? Melrose High School mm-hmm. in Melrose, Massachusetts. And uh, that is a Boston suburb? Yeah, it's about seven miles north of Boston. So, mm-hmm. And I, I hung out in the city all the time and didn't really hang out with the high school today. I thought I was like, knew all about crazy city mm-hmm. things, which I did not. I pretty uh-huh. much only knew stuff I learned from movies. <laughs> like, so do you still live in the I area? weirdly live like a mile from where I grew up. We, mm-hmm. we I lived in London for a long time i met my wife there we worked at cartoon network together mm-hmm. and then um oh really yeah. did you work with uh uh Dorena? I'm trying she to was think of in the, she was the head of cartoon network probably in yes. yeah yeah she's a kiwi she's yes yeah, yeah yes yes we, we did that she's was back here 2000s. working for yahoo oh okay yes in new york in new york oh yeah. yes i did i met her before yeah we because tcm was in there mm-hmm. and cnn and all that stuff this was in the 2002 yeah and uh, we moved back to Boston, and then we lived in Somerville, which is like the Brooklyn yes, of Boston, I know. Mm-hmm. Uh, for about 10 years, and, and we're looking to get a house, and we, I was like, I'm never moving back to where I grew up, and mm-hmm. I'm like, we're a mile and a half yeah. from where I grew up, which is mm-hmm. very, very strange. Actually, that is not, because um, statistically, uh, people wind up... Um, actually moving within 10 miles of where they grew up i guess you stay where you know mm-hmm. i mean you never moved to la because no, you like new york no. so much? My, yeah. my family grew up on perry street yeah i'm i moved five blocks yeah so yeah. it's it's probably true for yeah. just about everybody yeah, and i moved amazing. almost as far away as i could to london <laughs> and then i'm like and then we're back a mile yeah. and a half perfect that's great so to, to wrap up is there anything that you watch now like are there things that you can't miss or things that you yes, watch as a family and it or? is so deeply shameful um uh the like I am, the reality shows yes and one of the my spawn f- of the real world <laughs> the real housewives is I, I have a friend on it and um my little boy, uh, I was Carol Radziwill on uh-huh. Real Housewives of New York, and uh, I w- when she just started, I was I would you know go with her, and my little boy was like, "Listen, you're not going on that show. Do not go on the show. <laughs> if you do, don't come home." Yeah, like he was. Well, it's good to have that grounding. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I love. Um, I I don't know why, but uh, maybe because I American Family was so big in yeah. like 1971 yeah uh, which is a pbs series people forget it was sort of the first reality series yes and it was that agonizing episode where the son came out as gay yeah into the family. lance loud yeah very very interesting show and there's a great um albert brooks parody movie real life of that yes and then hbo did um a uh dramatic uh they did a movie about the louds, uh, the, the louds. and um so uh, I do like uh, The Real Housewives. My son and I, like, it's funny. Like, I've never seen an episode of The Wire right. or Breaking, uh, Bad. Breaking Bad or um, what is like, Mad a, like Mad Men. No, never. 
But show me a midget renovating his bathroom, and oh, I'm yeah. all over it. Oh, yeah. we. My wife and I watch this old house every week, mm-hmm. and we'll literally turn to each other and go, we just spent 10 minutes literally watching a guy hammer nails. <laughs> Nothing else happened. A guy just hammered nails. What are we doing? We're like, well, I don't know why we're watching this. Yeah. It was funny. I was out with some girls last night, and... Uh, we were saying, like, uh, Debbie Mazar, who's yep. a friend, she's got a great show called Younger. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, it's very kind of, it's smart and cheeky, and Debbie's awesome, and it's a really interesting uh, idea of a 40-plus-year-old woman who can't get a job as a, because she smells right. like an old person. Right, right. That's <laughs> and then she dresses up as a 26-year-old. Right. And... Um, and, and it's and it's really smart, so uh, I like that. And Debbie uh, did a lot of stuff on MTV too. She did a lot of stuff with VH1. I think she co-hosted like some stuff with RuPaul. And, yes. Oh, uh, um, yeah. Debbie is amazing. I was actually with her the night she met her husband. Oh, nice. Uh, I was on. We were. She's was Madonna's makeup artist. Yes, yeah, she started as makeup artist. And uh, she'd be great on your podcast. I'd she's incredible. Love to talk to her. She had a cooking show too. Her yeah. cooking show is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Extra virgin. So I like that show. Um, I watch tons of sports. I live for... Some things stay the same. Yeah, still I live for the Rangers. And um, uh, Are there any shows from your youth that you felt you had to introduce your son to? Like uh, everyone I know Yeah, the little... Kid. Okay, so when my son was born, uh, I loved the Little Rascals. Okay. And... I have the box set of every yep. Little Rascals. So you were probably and watching those on PIX or something. Yes, yes, up, yes. Yeah. With Officer Joel Bolton. Yep. And uh, so I would watch. I would. I would watch them to my show them to my son, and we would just kill ourselves laughing. And what was really interesting, as he was just starting starting to talk, he actually picked up lingo. From the little rascals. That's dangerous. So you'd be like, say, sister, <laughs> let's hot foot it out of here. Why is your son talking like a 1940s gangster? Like <laughs> because he, he's, uh, he's hiding out. Like, no, I swear, I'm a kid. It was really funny. That's fantastic. Um, Are you and, a Dick Tracy villain? <laughs> yeah, it was really funny because he totally uh, picked up these mannerisms just for a short time. But yeah. was, I wish it lasted forever. But um, I, I, I do like to show him things like zoom i think right. i have like a bunch of, i've got every oh, yeah. zoom book produced in boston at WGBH. I know. um my sister every year when i go out for the golden globes uh i usually i do all the red carpet interviews for hbo and i would bring my sister kate and i'd have the makeup artist come and do my hair and makeup yep. and i was like oh can you just do my sister while she's here yeah. and i was like okay well, can you just give me your your pass and then you can go home and yeah. i just i just said to my sister pretend you're my makeup right, artist right. and my and i gave her like a, a powder puff and yeah. kate like lost her mind she's on the red carpet With just taking pictures of everybody and like not doing her job but right. my producer was just like i love this makeup artist like, <laughs> she's like she's unorthodox she's, she's like, playing by her own role <laughs> yeah, she's, she's really funny and charming and we my sister my sister has red hair and freckles we don't look anything alike and um and then, like, we went out to all these parties, and my sister's, like, you know, is get like has got, like, a Soul Train dance line nice. with uh, Will Farrell, and everybody <laughs> loves Kate. Yeah. So they're like, oh, my gosh, where did you find this makeup artist? And I said, well, Known actually, <laughs> she's my sister. I let the makeup artist go about 12 hours ago. <laughs> and the guys at MTV, my, my uh, wonderful production crew, they, ever since then, have put Kate on the call sheet and they fly her in that's fantastic and because she's so much fun uh <laughs> so kate and i we have this tradition when we go to la we go to the museum of broadcasting yep and we watch like the um the stuff that we're, we're 11 months we're uh 15 months apart my brother and i are 11 months apart almost irish twins yes so almost, almost <laughs> yeah, yeah. triplets yeah. so kate and i would go and uh We'd go to the museum and we'd watch like all old, you know, Zoom and after yep. school specials and uh, and we'd go every year and the Dogen at the uh, Museum of Broadcasting is like, it's our anniversary. You were here <laughs> like last year. I have pulled all the things for you. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. And he's like, you know, I've got the original, like the original commercials in my garage. And all of a sudden, like Kate and I are ready to like follow yeah. this guy. Show them to us. We want to see those funny face drink mix commercials. I yeah, remember? I know. It's funny. My friend Julianne Moore, her, the name of her book is Freckles. 
freckle face strawberry. Yeah, yeah. Which was funny face. Yeah, which was huge. It was a rival to Kool Aid. Yes, I the yeah. Kool Aid rival. The Kool Aid rival. That's uh, they won that war. Yes, but they, they did. Back. But you remember that because there was a really racist one too. Oh yeah, it was uh, Chinese cherry. Yes. Well, there was also the Lemonheads. They had Cherry Clan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Horrific. Um, now they're just cherry heads. I do. I um, show my son old commercials, and I like found like a really racist Jello commercial. Uh, There's many for, uh, um, and he was like, "Oh my gosh! Like this is so not okay. They're yeah. making fun of of Asian people right. as like as if like in in like they like it's all like." so insane it's, it's like good fun it's like mickey rooney in yes in, um, uh, breakfast, in at breakfast at tiffany it's yeah. like it makes that look it's crazy uh, it, i think that's amazing that you show your son that because co- i think context is mm-hmm. lost in the world today mm-hmm. and it's it's interesting to see some of that stuff you're like okay this uh, for the time was okay but still like mickey rooney you're like nah this was not ever okay yeah. <laughs> this is just wrong do you ever show him any commercials that you did yes and actually um uh, it, I, I don't really think it, it. He's not interested. No, or like he really has no like. He's in fifth grade now, and like Dumb and Dumber is on a lot, right. and yeah. a lot of his friends recognize me from that or from some of the Disney movies. Um, uh, so I'd show him because it's funny because like a lot of our friends are like essentially cause riots, like right. when. Yeah, there's a paparazzi factor going and, on, yeah. uh, not with me, but with with my with my friends, and so I think it's been interesting. Um, we went on set to see George uh, do a new movie that Jodie Foster was directing. Oh wow! And uh, you know, and he just sees what a pain in the ass everything. Yeah. And I was like, "Do you have any interest?" He sees and behind he, the curtain. Yeah, and it looks and he, like work. And he's like, "Yeah." I'm playing a hockey lady. Yeah, like it's yeah. it's interesting that it just uh, doesn't turn his head at, right, at all. Right. Do you think it ever will? If he said, "I want to, I want to be an actor," or whatever. No, he did a few voices for the Fantastic Mr. Fox yep. when he was little, but no, it's uh, it's. I think he's really confident in uh, in his. Uh, belief that this is not for him. Yeah, the magic's kind of gone because it's like seems like being a carpenter or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's kind of interesting. I think uh, he's had an interesting life getting a window to right. this and right. uh, and and seeing our friends who have just who are so beloved. Right. Um, and he just is like, why does everyone know them? He knows them in a very different way. Yeah, which is yeah. interesting. And 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 I imagine some of those things that those people are in are unavoidable if you live in America in yeah. this world. So it'd be weird to be flipping through the channels and be like, why is my mom's friend on the TV? Like, yeah. this is very strange. Yeah, no, they, yeah they'll be here. And it's, yeah. it's kind of interesting. Yeah. But, um, a perspective. Yeah, it's been great. Well, I really enjoyed spending this time with oh, you. And you I so love your, I was checking out your podcast. And oh, I thank love you. it. And thank you. Uh, I'm going to tell all my friends to come on. Thank you so much. That would be amazing. You I are love fantastic at this. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> From a very practiced expert. That's well, needs enjoy a lot. your jerky. Thank you very much. And thank you for, you are a very good TV guidance counselor. Oh, thank you. <laughs> There you go. That's Karen Duffy, uh, aka Duff. Um, that was one of the best episodes that I've I've recorded, I think, and I had had a ton of fun. And I cannot thank her enough for taking the time to talk to me. Again, buy her books, uh, read her writing. She's written for for all kinds of things, uh, and, and and is a great writer. And I always enjoy reading things she writes, as will you. And if you like the show, please rate and review the show. It's a huge help. Helps get the word out there to people about the show. And if you have any questions or comments or anything like that, feel free to email me at tvguidancecounselor at gmail dot com or at can at iCanRead.com. Go to our Facebook page, just search TV Guidance Counselor, or you can tweet to us at TV Guidance on Twitter. And I love hearing from you guys. I always try to get guests that you request. I try to answer your questions when I can, uh, based on my uh, somewhat unlimited knowledge of television. Uh, I don't know everything, but I will try to find out. And I just, again, like hearing what you guys think of the show and and hearing that you guys listen. It, It means quite a bit. So as always, I thank you. And as always, we will see you again 
I, can I say as always more often in this episode? Um, I possibly could. I, in fact, I just said it again. But Wednesday, we'll see you again for a brand new episode of TV Guidance Council. Songs don't have to make sense. But show me a midget renovating his bathroom and oh, I'm yeah. all over it.